You caught me on the, ho on the hop then. Good morning, everybody. Who found that informative and helpful? There's obviously so much more we could talk about, but, um, you know, as far as the church goes here, where, you know, it's good to join yourself and enjoy and receive from the ministry and be a part of the ministry of the church, but can I just say it's really important that we connect with the mission of the church, not just the ministry, but the mission. You know, we've got a great message, we've got a great ministry, but have me know we also need as a church to have a great mission. And uh, so we've got our local mission and so many local mission things we could talk about this morning. Uh, but we're not, but, but just there's lots of things we're doing locally. Uh, and then, of course, OS and, and globally this morning, as Alistair has shared with us today. So, hey, who enjoyed hearing from Angela? This is great. And uh, I remember when Angela went out to uh, Kenya as a young girl and it was tough going and just watching her, her incredible strength and resilience and her stickability, she's worked through that and just seeing the fruit and the, the, the good things that God's opened up for her and over the last five years or so, it's just tremendous and uh, it's a real privilege to partner. So we support Angela, we support all those other things that... Um, that Alistair alluded to this morning, so we, we do support, so when, when you give to mission in this church, that's what it's going to, it's going to those things that we mentioned this morning, and so uh, when it comes time for giving this, uh, this morning, and, and when it comes time to giving, always know that on your little giving slip you can give to mission, and anything you give to mission goes directly to our mission partners, and to mission-oriented things in the life, through the life of this church, amen, so you receive that, so I want to go to the Word this morning, and uh, I want to continue on. Last week we started our, on Vision Sunday, we, we announced our theme for the year. Can anybody remind me what it was? There it is. That's a good looking door, isn't it? Open the door. 2024 is the year of open. You know, there's something powerful, just to remind you this morning, there's something powerful about opening something, opening a business opening a savings account, uh, opening your wallet. Well, nothing changes when I open my wallet, but anyway, that's another story. Um, you know, opening up a gift, all that potential and opportunity and possibility is released when something is open, yeah? And, uh, you know, we, we talked last week, we mentioned about a time in our life in the last few years during COVID where everything was closed. And then it come time for opening up again and just to see all that, all that, uh, potential that had been closed down and shut down as the place opened up. Who would agree that open was much better than closed? And I, this, throughout this year, we're going to be talking about, there's a number of things that we, that we need to open. Uh, maybe things that have been closed in us for too long. Things that you and I need to open, and we're going to be teaching on those things throughout the year, but uh, there are dimensions and there are directions and there are destinies, how's that, three Ds, there are dimensions, there are directions, and there are destinies, destinies that only God can open up in your life. So there's a lot of things that we need to open, and we'll, we'll get to those, but I want to focus our thoughts primarily this morning around things that only God can open. And Jesus put it this way, and it's our key verse, where Jesus said this, "'Ask, and you shall receive,' Matthew 7, 7, seek and you shall knock and the door will be opened. Knock and the door will be opened. There is doors that only God can open for us. I could, let's call them divine doors. They might look natural, but only God can open them. There's divine, div divine doors that He opens to take us from one place into another. That's what doors do. They take us out from one place and they take us into another. And, uh, you know, we often judge life by our current circumstance. We judge life by the room we're in. We, we judge life's opportunities by the size and the space of the room that we might find ourselves in. But listen, it's not the size of the room you're in that matters. It's understanding that in that every room there is a door. And it's what God can do to open doors for you. I took my car. Um, I wanted to get a little bit of wrapping done um, across the front of my car. With, there's a bit of faded glass panel. I wanted to cover it. And I went around to the car wrapping place 
and uh, he took quite a bit, to come out and had a look at it, and uh, he, other places I rang, they just said, oh, mate, it's, it's too small a job, not interested. We went around to this guy, he, he looked at it, he said what he could do, um, and so I'm taking the car to him, and I said, as I left, I said, mate, thank you so much for taking time for such a small job. He goes, oh, he said, listen, it's not about the job being small, he said, you never know where a little job might lead. Isn't that true? And so often we can judge life's opportunities just by the rumour and despise something because, you know, the Bible says despise not the day of small beginnings. So we're in a room, we think, oh, this is not much of an opportunity. I'm only doing this little thing. No one even, no one knows on planet Earth or even exists. Listen, you, don't, you need to know that there is a God who opens doors. And it's the doors of opportunity that He opens, yes? Sometimes you might feel stuck like the die has been cast. This is my life. And sometimes we can even begin to take matters into our own hands and try and push through doors. And if there's not a door in that wall, we're just going to make a door in that wall. But here's the thing. God will lead us as we trust Him to open doors. And that doesn't mean we just become passive and we become lazy because there are some things that He requires of us. And so today I want to draw us back to that text, Matthew chapter 7. I want to look at it in the context of the passage of Scripture that it comes out of. So we're going to read Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 through to verse 12. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will knock, and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If then, if you then... Though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask Him? So, in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. It seems a little bit random. But we'll get to that. So, my prayer for you this morning is that this message will give you and I, stir up in us a new inclination to pray. Because there are some things that you are never going to receive. There are some things you're never going to find. There's some doors that are never going to be open unless you ask, seek, and knock. And there's something here that Jesus absolutely wants us to get. He actually says the same thing again in Luke 11. Uh, and in the context is in the disciples saying, Jesus, would you teach us how to pray? So Jesus taught them the Lord's Prayer. Then after he taught them the Lord's Prayer... Um, what does he do? He says, he winds it up and he says, so ask, it shall be given, seek and you will find, knock and the door shall be open. So Jesus wants us to get something here. And that's the first point this morning from this passage. Jesus urges us to pray. He urges us to pray. He, there's something here he really wants us, he says, I really want you to do this. And he just doesn't say ask. But he says, ask, seek, and in fact, there, it actually literally means ask and keep on asking, seek and keep on seeking, knock and keep on knocking. And so God is, he says, oh, he's very serious, Jesus is absolutely wanting you and I to get this. He says, I want you to get serious about this, I want you to get involved in this, see, asking, um, that requires us opening our mouths. Seeking requires more from us, right? Um, knocking, well, it implies a boldness and a persistence. In fact, when Jesus used this term in Luke chapter 11, in the Luke account, uh, when the disciples asked him how to teach us how to pray, he, he then goes on and gives a story about a man knocking on his neighbor's door, his friend's door, at 12 o'clock at night wanting a loaf of bread. And Jesus actually commends him for his boldness because eventually the friend, I don't know if he was his friend anymore, got up and answered the door as he persisted. And so Jesus here makes it so clear that he's urging us to pray. I want you to ask, I want you to seek, and I want you to knock. So that's the first point. Jesus is urging his listeners to pray. Secondly, he, he makes promises to those who do pray. He gives us three invitations, ask, seek, and 
Help me out here this morning. But he gives seven promises in, in verse 7. Of the, he says, you will receive. He says, you will find. And the door will be opened. In verse 8, the one that asks, receives. The one that seeks, finds. And the one that knocks, the door is open. And then in verse 11, he says this, how much more, everyone say, how much more, Will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask Him? So this is pretty unambiguous. He's, the the asker receives, the seeker finds, the one who knocks, the door's opened, and the Father gives good things to those who ask, seek, and knock. Wow. This is telling me And I'm encouraged in this, that I need to do a lot more asking, seeking and knocking. God's not bothered by it, He's honoured by it. And Jesus makes this so clear, that I need to pray often, I need to pray regularly. And I need to pray confidently and with faith, believing that I have been urged and invited to ask, seek and knock. And when I do, God will do something that He would not have done unless I asked, sought and knocked. But then he goes on and he makes himself available at every different level of life. Because often we, we kind of think, I don't know if I can do that. I, I've got to get my ducks lined up first before I can ask him for anything. Well, I've discovered in my lifetime that there's lots of different levels of closeness to God. I don't know if you've found the same. But I want you to notice this morning that Jesus just doesn't say, ask, ask, ask. Or he just doesn't say, seek, seek, seek. And he just doesn't say, knock, knock, knock. But he says, ask, seek, and knock. And there's, there's different levels of proximity and presence around each of those requests. Imagine you're a, you're a, a kid and you're at home with your father. And you have a need. So if your father's right near you, if he's standing with you, if his presence is near, he's present, there's nothing in between you, well, you just simply, what do you do? You just, you just ask, right? He's with, you feel like he's close, he's, he's in proximity, he's present, you, you can just ask. And it's like, Dad, could you help? But then imagine that, that same situation occurs, but the father is not in the room, but he's somewhere else. He's in the house somewhere, but he's, he's somewhere else. And so before the, the kid who wants something, before he can ask, what does he have to do first? He has to go and find him. He has to seek. And when he finds him, he goes, oh, dad, could you? Right? So you've got ask, you've got seek. What's the third one? No. Now imagine that you go and you find him and then when you find him, you discover he's in another room and there's a door between you and him and the door's locked or the door's shut. So what do you have to then do? You have to knock. There's something between you and him and so you have to knock and he says, come in. So here's the point today. We all experience God in different levels of his presence. Sometimes it feels like he's really close. And, you know, some of you this morning are feeling it. It's like, you know, his presence is close. He's, he's, there's a, there's a, the proximity is close. Um, but then there's times where maybe you feel like he's not so close. You're not sure, is God even, is God even there? Well, sometimes we've got to do a little bit of seeking. And then sometimes it feels like there's a barrier between us and God. There's a wall or something that's come up, but, and often it's usually our own doing, but somehow there's something separating us. And so this is Jesus' way of saying, whatever your level of accessibility or closeness to God is right now, no one is disqualified. Come, 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 ask, ask, seek, and knock. You might feel I'm close, well, just ask. You might feel like I'm, I'm away from you and you feel like there's an absence of my presence. Well, you come and do a bit of seeking. And maybe if you, f- you feel like you know where I am, but if you feel like there's a wall of separation, just do a little bit of knocking. Come on, come, come, come. Uh, if, if I'm right there, ask. 
If you have to go looking, you'll find him. If there's a barrier, knock and the door will be open. He makes it available to every level of life. No one's exempt. This asking, seeking, knocking business, well, it's just for a few spiros. No, 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 no. You're not disqualified from asking today. You're not disqualified from seeking. And you're not disqualified from knocking. No matter how close or how far you're invited to ask, seek, and knock. Is that good news this morning? You see, he urges us to pray. And then he makes promises when we do. And no one's exempt. But here's the fourth thing, and this is so important, that you've got to remember that you're coming to a father, your heavenly father. You see, when we receive Jesus... God becomes our heavenly Father. Look, what does John 1, 12 says? To all who received him, who's him? Who's him? Jesus, to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become what? Children of God. You see, Father, when we talk about God and we call Father, it's not a throwaway label for Jesus. It's not. It's actually one of the greatest of all Christian truths that God actually becomes our Father. Now I can hear this morning already and feel it in the air for some. It's like, oh yeah, right. (laughs) Because our experience of knocking on our earthly father's door was like, get the heck out of here. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this this morning, but Some of you this morning couldn't describe the pain caused by your earthly father. You have father wounds, dad wounds. And it's a real stumbling block when I talk about, or when anybody talks about God as our father. Now listen, here's here's what I want you to get today, and do not miss this. This people, People are about to find some freedom in this this morning. You see, Jesus knows that. When the people, he knew that. And so he's encouraging them to pray. He's encouraging you and I this morning to pray by comparing, by comparing our earthly father with our heavenly father. What does verse 11 say? Verse 11, if you then, though you are evil, that's flattering, know how to give good gifts to your children, How much more, everyone say, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask Him? You see, the key phrase there is how much more. You see, I don't know if you can try and quantify this, but the difference between, you might say, well, I didn't have a bad father, I had a good earthly father. Well, okay, let's just for argument's sake say today that the difference between a a bad earthly father and a good earthly father, let's say the distance is this much. Well, I want you to know that the difference, the distance between a good earthly father and your heavenly father is that. Does that make sense? If you think the distance between a good and a bad earthly father is that, no matter what the difference is, The difference between a good earthly father and your heavenly father is infinitely greater. How much more? How much more? Listen to me carefully. Write this down if you're taking notes. Don't ever limit your understanding of your heavenly father to your experience of your own earthly father. Can I say that one more time? Don't ever limit your understanding of your heavenly father to your experience of your own earthly father. You might be a 40-year-old child with bad memories of your father and Jesus is saying, I want you to ask, seek and knock full of hope and faith because your father in heaven is 10,000 times better than the best earthly father could ever be. Can I hear a good amen? 
You see, our Heavenly Father, He's infinitely righteous. That means He will always do what is right. He's infinitely good. He will always and only do what is good. He is infinitely wise. His ways are far higher than our ways. He is infinitely loving. He will never give you anything that is unhelpful, harmful or hurtful. He'll always give you what is good. He's our dad in heaven. That's who we're praying to. Now, church, don't miss this. This is so important. Because I feel a tension in the air when we read that scripture. Because I hear people say, well, that's not my experience. I asked. I I was seeking and I knocked. Didn't get what I asked, sought and knocked for. And here's what I want you to understand today. And this is why this Father in heaven, we've got to understand, he's, Jesus always talks about when we're praying, we're praying to our Father. When Jesus taught us how to pray, he said what? Our, that's why Jesus said that. That is the context of your prayer. The context of your prayer is always that you're talking to a Father, an infinitely good Father, not a genie. He's a father in heaven, not a genie in a lamp. You see, asking, seeking and knocking in prayer only makes sense if you understand it in the terms of a father-child relationship. Only makes sense. And when you pray, our father, it means that whenever we pray, whenever we ask, seek and knock, we always come as a child, whatever our age, we always come as a child of God. That's why Jesus said, when you pray, pray our Father. You see, prayer has to have a safety catch. You have a new babe in the house and it grows up and it starts to walk. You put things on your cupboards called safety catches. You have safety locks on your microwave and washing machine and your stove correct because you want to make the house childproof you want to make your appliances childproof because children think they know what they're doing but they don't and that's the point this morning is that when i begin to understand that god is my father i can ask seek and knock with confidence and with a great sense of comfort because i know that he is righteous good and loving you see, the, the genie in the bottle model is prayer without a safety catch. Do you know, it's, it's possible, it's a, it's a slightly off the beaten track, but did you know it's possible to ask amiss? We can ask amiss, we can ask for the... Listen to what James chapter 4 and verse 3 says. When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with what? Wrong motives, so that you may spend what you get on... Your pleasures. So we can ask amiss. Can I just say, what, whatever our asking is, that God will never give amiss. He'll always give us, He'll always give us according to His character and His nature. Can you imagine a five-year-old with a genie lamp, where the genie is bound to give that five-year-old whatever they ask for? Can you imagine... If a five-year-old gets hold of that lamp, what are you going to do? Man, you are going to leg it out of there. If there's a 10-year-old with the genie lamp, there's an adult, you'll be going, well, they're not making very good decisions. Man, if a 15-year-old gets that lamp, forget it. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? You see, the fact is, don't miss this, we are never in a position that Aladdin's lamp is ever going to become good for you. Never, whatever age you're at. Because I was thinking about my life. When I, when I was 25, I thought, gee, I was dumb at 15. If I've got any friends out there? <laughs> A few heads shaking. When I was 35, I thought, oh, gee, I didn't know much at 25. When I was 50, it was kind of like, when I was 35, boy, I wish I knew then what I knew now, right? So, because I, like, 
you know, when I was 15, really, I was still a child, really, compared to 25. And when I was, you know, 25, I was, I was actually, I was still actually a child compared to what I am at, at 50. And um, you see this, see this scenario here. And then as a 60-year-old, I think back to when I was 50 and go, boy, I wish I'd known what I know now when I was 50. Really, when I was 50, I was, in a lot of ways, I was still a bit of a child. You get the picture this morning. So I'm always a child. I always come as a child-father relationship. So that comes back to the key verse. What about the verse that says, ask and I will give? Because he doesn't always. And there's a tension there. And sometimes it's because of that tension. We might have asked God for a big one and it didn't happen. And because of that tension, we come to a place where we never ask, we never seek and we never knock again. Come on, let's be honest, church. We stop asking, we stop seeking, and we stop knocking because we didn't get what we asked for. That, my friend, is only a contradiction. Ask and you will receive, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open. That's only a contradiction if you think of prayer in genie terms instead of father terms. Did you catch that? That only ever becomes a contradiction if if we start thinking about prayer in genie terms as opposed to father terms. Jesus understands this. How many of you think Jesus knew what prayer was all about? In in Hebrews 5 and verse 7, listen to what it says of Jesus. It says, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard, but the prayer wasn't answered. Oh my God, my God, if this is possible, please let this cup pass from me. It wasn't answered. Why? Because Jesus was submitted to his his Father. Is this helping anybody this morning? Is it helping anyone else this morning? What about the Apostle Paul? The Apostle Paul, he, 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 we, we can look it up three, three times. He prayed and asked God to take a thorn out of his flesh. There's something in my life that I don't want. God, would you please take it out? I'm so weak. Could you please take this thorn from me? Get rid of it. And then God answered. He said, he answered. And he said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. Paul said, would you please take this from me and I'll be strong Get rid of it, Jesus said. If you keep it and trust me, you'll be strong. Did you see that? Can I just say this this morning? Thank God for a fatherly safety catch when it comes to my prayers. Because I've prayed some things that I'm so glad now that God never did answer. And we need to understand that his ways are so much higher than ours. And I trust him with that. Have I got any friends out there today? I trust him for that. And so what that, what that means is this. When I, come, when I start to ask, seek and knock, I don't have to censor my prayers. Because my, I, I just trust my Father. I, can, I don't have to censor my prayers. I can come before him and I can ask for what is on my heart and, and for what I can see is the thing that I need the most. And do you know what? I can trust him and there's a great comfort in that because I know that Father in heaven knows better than I do. He's not my genie, he's my father. And before, and, and there's, he, even if he doesn't ever, if he does another thing in my life, he, he owes me nothing. And so, Father, I can come and I can open my heart and I can pour out my heart and I can ask you what I will. And you know what, Father, you will sort it all out. I trust you. Come on. Come on. I don't sense in my prayers, my, my, my prayers. Trayers, trayers are a little bit like a prayer, but that's all right. I don't have to censor my prayers. I trust him. And so he urges us to pray. How many of you get this this morning? How many of you sense Jesus urging us kids to pray? He urges us to pray. Ask, seek, 
and knock. He promises good gifts to those who do. Because he's a good father, we can trust him. Come on now. He's a good father, we can trust him. No one's exempt. It doesn't matter how close or how far you might feel from God. The fact is we can all ask, we can all seek, and we can all knock. So what about verse 12? That was a bit random. What's verse 12 say? So, in in light of this, in everything you do, in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. That's called what? The gold, the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's the Christian golden rule. That's where, that's, that's where it comes from. And there's, there's other golden rules out, but that, that is the golden rule. And so it's in the context, you'll be interested to know that the context of the golden rule, and it's the same in Luke, is in the context of praying. It's in the context of asking, seeking, and knocking. And here's, what, here's the point. He wants our asking and our seeking and our knocking to be primarily... I said primarily, not exclusively, but primarily focused on others. Come on now, church. That that receives a very weak response. So we're all going, I thought this was all about me. But that's why at the end of it, do unto others as you would have them do to you. He wants to give to others the very things that you desire. And so we do a lot of asking, seeking and knocking on behalf of others. And this begins to direct our prayers. We don't get consumed with us, but it keeps us focused. How many of you know that's a good thing for our hearts? It's a good thing for our God's smart, isn't he? He's smart. And okay, we, we can ask God, we can seek God, we can knock on doors for our own personal lives. But let me tell you, the majority, the, the, the bulk of our asking, seeking, and knocking is on behalf of others. It's about God, would you please work in their life? Would you open the door for them? How prepared are we to ask, seek, and knock for others as we are to ask, seek, and knock for ourselves? And so prayer is not just about looking for our thing, but it's about looking for others. And this begins to direct our prayers. And do you know what, incidentally? I think we should also begin to ask big. We ask big. Come on. Ask big. Asking, seeking and knocking for doors to open. A man by the name of Bill Bright started a ministry called Campus Crusade for Christ. It was a great university ministry. It affected the world. Him and his team got together. They got a map of the world and they prayed this prayer. Father in heaven, give us the world. Wow, that's a prayer, isn't it? Give us the world. John Knox, a famous preacher uh, in Scotland, he was famous for a prayer that he prayed. Give me Scotland or I die. Give me Scotland or I die. How many of you know that's a big prayer? And it's not for John Knox, it's for others. It's for others. What about Jossie Charco, Empart, back in 2003 or whenever it was, wherever it was we started with him and with his ministry, him and a young man walked through India and they, they began to ask God. They said, God, give us 100,000 churches by the year 2030. Give us 100,000 church plants by the year 2030. Help us transform communities right across this nation, this unreached nation of North India. Father, give us North India or we die. How many of you know that's a big prayer? That's a big prayer. I haven't heard Angela uh, and Isaac personally praying of late, but I can guarantee you that they've prayed, God, give us a generation of young men, young men who are growing up in a slum, but are going to find a purpose and a change in their life that will change their life and generations to come forever. God, give us a generation of young men and young women. (laughs) That's a good prayer, isn't it? That's a good prayer. And we could go through... Our, our, our mission supporters this morning, the Downies in the Philippines, I know, they are incredible church planters. They're mavericks, but they are amazing church planters. And they've prayed, Father, give us the Philippines. Give us this village. Give us that area. Help us to plant a church. Father, open doors of opportunity for us, would you please, God? The, the Luscombs up in Fitzroy, I guarantee that they've prayed, Father, give us the indigenous community in Fitzroy Crossing. That's a prayer for others. Do unto others as you would want for yourself. And when when we pray those big prayers, you know what? God goes, finally, finally, somebody's asking me something that honors me. 
Finally, someone's asking something that honours who I am. You know, we often sit around and go, has anyone got a prayer request? Ooh, um, ooh, um, ooh, um, um, mm. Come on. And I'm saying myself in this, come on. Let's pray and ask and believe God to do something. He does small things, we know that. And like I said, he opens doors that lead into... But can I just say, we need to ask that God will open doors that lead into incredible opportunities of ministry for the kingdom of God. Who believes that this morning? Come on. <laughs> Jesus. Jesus. Something that's so big. Something that's so big that it was kind of like, God, if you don't, it won't. How many of you could pray some prayers like that? We need to remind ourselves that he's the one who does abundantly above, which is, which abundantly above more than we can dare, dare to ask or think. Go on, I dare you. Go on, I dare you. There's things you're never going to receive unless we rise up to our knees and we ask and we seek and we knock. Do you receive the word this morning? I hope this morning that this is putting something, that there's, this, this is not something that's coming from out in, but this is something that's going to rise up inside of you. And it's, Some of you gave up praying, asking, seeking, knocking, because you've had some disappointments. It's kind of like, I'm just going to just get on with life. Can I just say, whatever your disappointments, whatever's been in the past, I want to encourage you today. This is God saying, you need to open, open. Everyone say open. Open your heart and your mind to begin again, to ask, seek, and knock. I'm opening myself, God. I'm not shut. I'm not sitting there this morning hearing these words, and I'm shut, and they're bouncing off me, and it's like, well, God, I tried that once, but no, 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 I'm opening myself. I'm going to ask, I'm going to seek, and I'm going to knock, because you're a loving Father. You know better than me, and I'm just going to, I don't have to, I don't have to vet my prayers. I don't have to censor my prayers. Father, I'm asking you today. I'm asking, I'm seeking, I'm knocking. I'm daring to ask, I'm seeking, and I'm knocking. So, Father, this morning I'm praying that you would put a fire inside of us today. Of asking, seeking, knocking. Forgive us, Father, for shrinking back, for holding back, for just looking back. shutting off you from the possibilities and the doors that are open before us, that will open before us if we don't only ask, seek and knock. Father, I pray that you'd help us to be people who focus those prayers primarily outwards. Lord, that you would heal our desires today that we wouldn't ask amiss. That we would be people who, on behalf of others, we'd stand in the gap on their behalf and we would ask, we'd seek, we'd knock. Father, we pray for our missionaries today. We, come on, let's stand for a minute. Let's let's just lift up our missionaries for a moment. I want you you to begin to just pray in your own words. Begin to pray for Angela and Isaac. Begin to pray for Jossie, M Park, Ministry in North India. Father, we lift them up for you today. We pray for them. You would open incredible doors of opportunity. We know uh, even there, Lord, Lord, doors have, have, have attempted to be shut. Father, we're praying for open doors of ministry. Father, for, for the Downies as they seek to establish another church plant. Father, open doors for them, we pray today. Father, we ask, we seek, and we knock. Father, for the Luscombs in the Fitzroy Crossing, pray that you would continue to open doors for them today in Jesus' name. Father, the Hiltons in Vietnam, as they, Lord, have a, as they establish uh, new missions, as they mentor and raise up other missionary leaders, Father, I pray open doors for them. 
in Jesus' name. Father, for us as a church, we thank you that we've walked through some doors as a church. And I pray that as we do, on behalf of others, that you will continue to open doors of opportunity for us into our community. Father, into Lord, to the people that you've placed us amongst and serve. Father, give us great um, asking, seeking, knocking prayers on behalf of those we pray. And so, Jesus, we pray. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you that you, Father, God, Creator, invite us to us seek and knock. Wow. What a mind-blowing privilege we have. Help us not to live in the tragedy of unasked, unsought after and unknocked on doors. Jesus. We thank you for it. And everyone said, you've got your communion in your hands. If you haven't, take it. Communion Communion represents so much to us. I said before in John 1, 12, so as many have received him and believed in his name, He gave the right to become Jesus, who believed in Jesus. He gave the right to become children of God. We don't earn that right. We can't somehow get our good deeds to outweigh our bad deeds, and then I'll become a child of God. No, no, Jesus gave the right. Salvation is given by believing in Jesus. His death burial and his resurrection on the cross. Salvation comes by believing, not by trying harder. And this morning we have communion, you see, which represents the body and the shed blood of Jesus on the cross. Sounds gory, but it was. And it reminds us today that our salvation is not, we're not self-righteous. We're not self-made Christians. We all come in need of a saviour and whoever believes in him he gives the right to become children of God that's why Jesus in John 10 is called the door I'm the door and this morning if you don't don't know for certain you've never put your trust in Jesus this morning before we have communion together you You can simply by asking, it's a prayer of invitation, say, Jesus, I don't understand all this. There's some things I've still got questions. But I know that Jesus, you are who you said you are. I believe in you. I believe in your death on the cross for me. You paid the price, substituted me. Jesus, I put my trust in you. You're my saviour. I want to be a child of God. I want to be a child of God. I wonder if there's anyone here this morning, you've never done that. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to make a spectacle. I just simply, I'm going to pray a prayer and a minute of invitation if someone responds. While every eye is closed, every head's bowed, just for a moment. If that's you this morning, you would like to do that. You'd say, look, Russell, I want to be included in that prayer. I, I want Jesus in my life. And right now it's like, it's like, what's going on here? Why, why am I feeling this way? Let me tell you. Jesus said, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock. It's the only door that you need to open. And that's the door of your heart. And this morning, it's, it's, you open your door of your heart by saying, Jesus, all right, I believe in you. And I want to invite you into my life. And I want to do it now. If that's you this morning, where you are, just simply just raise your hand just for a moment. I'll see it and I'll include you in the prayer. Anybody just looking across? It's not an awkward moment, but it is a moment of just contemplating. Jesus. Jesus. Father, we thank you that you sent your son Jesus, that he is the door. Jesus, because we believe in you, we have a right to be a child of God. 
We're not proud. We're not arrogant. Incredibly humble and grateful. We thank you, Jesus, for the gift of salvation. We receive you into our life. And we believe in your death on the cross. And in that sacrifice, Lord, my sin was paid for in full. I'm no longer separated from God. I'm forgiven. I'm restored. I'm a child of God. So come on, let's eat and drink together. Let's eat. Let's drink. Now come on, just for a moment, begin to thank him as the worship team begins to lead us. Come on. So come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get 